It's uh, your father's fault, Keisha. <laughs> he does those things every once in a while. He goes out and he prays for me before I come out here. And it's like he puts his hand on my chest and he's praying for me. And I'm like, dude, I got to go. Dude, I got to go. Dude. <laughs> You ever experienced that with your father at all? Like, you know, Dad, I gotta go. I gotta go. Hi. Hey. How are you guys? You look, you look great. You smell pretty good too. <laughs> really glad, really glad you guys are here today. Um, hi, cousin Christy. Cousin Joey. Got the cousins in the house. Always glad for that. Wow, look at all this stuff. They got water here and where's the candy? Man. Hey, um, happy Palm Sunday. Hope you all got your palms on the way in. How many brought your palms with you? Yeah, it's good. You know, I love the fact we have Palm Sunday, but I'm really, really glad that we get to experience what his palms actually bought for us every day of our life. Amen. I love Easter. For those of you who don't like it being called Easter, then call it Bunny Day. For those of you who don't like Bunny Day, call it Resurrection Day. Here's the deal, here's the deal. We have Easter, we have Palm Sunday, we have Christmas to represent something amazing that somebody did. His name is Jesus. But the beauty about it is, is it just doesn't have to happen on Easter or Christmas anymore. It actually can happen every single day of our lives. In fact, it, I really, I'm just, I'm like, I'm being pushed. In fact, it might actually be able to happen every moment of every single day of our lives. What if we actually could walk in the resurrection lifestyle every minute of every day? What if when somebody's like chewing on our face, we actually can live in a resurrection lifestyle when they're chewing on our face? Who invited California here today? Or Texas, excuse me, excuse me, Texas. Did you bring your plane? You didn't bring your plane today. You parked out back. Helicopter? Chopper. Okay, good. Hi, Shannon. I just love you. Um, Ithaca, too? We're letting people from Ithaca come here? Okay. How many is from somewhere? Raise your hand. If you haven't raised your hand, you better check and see. Because you actually are from somewhere. I'm just... Um, you know, I, I, um, you've heard it said that love isn't a feeling. How, how many have heard that said? How, how many believe that, that love is a feeling? Huh, you didn't say that this morning. Oh, you're changing your answer. You know, I said I wanted to have like our staff and our leadership sit in the front. I'm just changing my mind on that whole deal. All right, ready, ready, ready for this? Everybody all right? Okay, it's all good. Um, if love isn't a feeling, I don't want it. I don't want God's love if it's just out of duty. Can I turn that around? He doesn't want your love if it's out of duty. Lord told me, you know, this week, for those of you who come from a different background, you might want to say that the Lord impresses on you or suggest to you, or maybe you just in your stomach you hear this, or, but you know, I, 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 I'm just, my, my personal belief is, is that you actually, that prayer is actually two-way communication. Like I actually believe that we speak to him and he speaks to us, and when I'm in his presence, I like what he says a whole lot more than what I say. So I sit and I listen more in my time of prayer than I do talking. And it's, it's beautiful, how, how many know that when you take time to listen, you actually can hear? Whether that's with your wife. <laughs> you ever have your wife do this? Focus, focus, <laughs> put the flicker down, <laughs> you know? Uh, 
Ariel, Ariel will, will do, excuse me, Dad, excuse me, excuse me, hello, woo down here. And she, she wants me to listen with my eyes. She wants me to listen with my full attention. She'll actually say, is it okay if I talk now? And sometimes I think, sometimes I think that maybe the father is kind of that way. Hey, man, I, you know, I've heard all your petitions. I've heard all your wants. I've heard your checklist. I've heard the, all this stuff. Can I talk now? And not in a bad way, but how many know that when the father speaks, the one who benefits the most is you? Yes? Yeah. So, so that was all a whole nother, you know, sermon, but it got me to this point where, you know, he said to me, he said, um, wow, I must, kids, you should probably go. Did I not do that? Did they already go? Have fun. Anybody else? We're all good? Everybody do this. <laughs> get all the jitters out. You can't do that? Oh, I get it. Oh, we're in church. We could never do something like that. Bruce. Bruce. You're not a kid, bro. All right. Have fun, you guys. <laughs> they keep going. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm all right. <laughs> they don't not just walking out anymore, they're running out of here. I um I When he said to me, he said, Scott, you gotta stop believing the lies you were taught in church. It kind of took me back a little bit. But then he said, not everything you were taught in church was lies. I just want you to stop believing the lies that you were taught in church. See, I, I've grown up in, uh, in various degrees of church experiences. Sometimes our church has been very traditional over the years that I've been here. I've been here 52 years. My dad was here before that. I haven't been pastor 52 years. <laughs> I've been alive 52 years. And uh, we used to be like, you know, three hymns, a 20 minute message, and we all went to Burger King, which was cool. I'm into Burger King. I wanted McDonald's, but they went to Burger King. And um, even in the time that Lisa and I have been pastors here, about 15 years now, our church has gone on a journey. We were very, um, I'll call it user-friendly, but I think they call it seeker-friendly to begin with. We were, we were very much about making church so palatable that when you came in here compared to Walmart, there wasn't any difference. I, 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 uh, we were in this mindset that social activities were more important than kingdom activities. And it's not that, not, it's not, listen, it's not that that was wrong for the time that we were in. That's all we knew to do. And we gave our 100% for what we knew to do. But how many know that as you grow up, you're, you, you're not supposed to act like children anymore? And how many, and see, so, so, and I'm not saying that we were acting like children. We just were in the place that we gave 100% of the light that we actually were walking in at the time. But how many know that God his intention is, is for us to mature and to increase in light. I used to make every message very relevant. I used to teach people how to take care of their finances, how to take care of their marriages, how to raise their children, how to, how to cook some meals, how to do physical exercise, and none of those things work for me. So I said, there's gotta be something more than principles. There's gotta be something more than just a good teaching. There's gotta be something more than setting your clock by how long the service is. Are you, are you trapped? Now, I'm not, listen, we honor time, we do all that type of stuff. We, are, we live in time, God's timeless, and we try to make something timeless happen in, in time. It gets a little difficult sometimes, but we try to honor that. But here's, you know, when you, when the Bible says to know to do something and not do it is sin. So when the Father invites you into a new life or a new level or a new a new um, a a attitude and altitude, you don't go back to where you were. You go, you, there's no direction in the kingdom except for forward. Right. 
Everything is from glory to glory to glory to glory, and a lot of people want to stay in the last glory, and so they live in the last glory, and then that last glory that was a glory actually becomes a religious activity. Am I making sense? Okay, so if he wants us to grow, everybody would agree that he wants us to grow in our maturity ourselves individually, yes? Does he also want our church to grow in its maturity corporately? Okay, so with that said, as we are growing in our maturity as a body, is it possible that somebody might come in here that's brand new to Christianity? Yes. Hopefully, otherwise we're really not growing in our maturity because our maturity should attract those that want what we carry. Okay, all right, so all that is said to say this, that he brought me up to this statement to not believe the lies, because here's a lie. Here's a lie that we've been taught and we've bought into and we've believed, and I've believed it until this week. This is how fresh this is. That love isn't a feeling, it's a commitment. If that's true, then when you see that child being born, the only thing I want you to do is make a commitment to that child. Anybody ever see a child being born? Anybody ever not have any emotions when you see that child being born? Well, we're very glad you're here. I'll write down the time and the date. Thank you very much. I'll see you at high school graduation. That's not what we do, is it? We celebrate, we cry, we laugh, we hold, we are broken, we're, we're drawn. I, t- I told Ariel, it's lucky you're so cute. I would not love you this way. How many of you know that God absolutely adores you? First, we just gotta get that. If we just get that. But you gotta understand that he's not doing it because he has to. He's not doing it because he's supposed to. And he's not doing it because he made a commitment to it. He's doing it because he wants to. You move God emotionally. God has emotions. I just wanna propose to you, there is nothing ever accomplished in the kingdom without emotions. How do I know? Because the Bible tells me so. How do I know? Jesus, when he raised somebody from the dead, what was the first thing he did? Anybody remember that story? You might have learned it in Sunday school, and if you didn't, it's called the story of Lazarus. The story of Lazarus is this. He was moved with compassion and he bawled at the loss of his friend. Remember this theology that we have that without love, all these other things are just noise? We've made love a commitment. Well, without, if I don't walk in love, you know, Pastor Scott, I don't like that person, but I gotta love him. How many times I've heard that? Well, Pastor, I'm gonna stay in this marriage because it's the thing I should do. No, you should stay in that marriage because it's the thing you get to do. You should be thrilled that God has invited somebody to move into covenant with you. Well, she's not walking in covenant. Okay, then invite her into a covenant that actually you're demonstrating in unconditional love, which means what? No conditions attached. No, I'm gonna stay married because I have to. I, I'm, glad your parent, I'm glad your kids are gonna see that in you. Listen, I'm not talking jam, I'm not jamming anybody up. What I wanna do is I wanna say this. You'll never discover, I didn't know this till this week, I've never heard it said, I've never heard it spoken. You'll never know your destiny purpose until you learn to be emotional. Doesn't that hurt in Christianity? Well, Pastor Scott, that, you know that church service, you know that church service, that over at GT, they get a little emotional over there. Pastor Scott had to take the chandeliers down because people were swinging from them. <laughs> Got rid of the pews because they were dancing on the backs of them. Let me ask you this question. Why is it that bars are so much fun? Pastor Scott, how do you know bars are fun? 
I've never drank in my life, but I've been called a friend of sinners. But I share that title with somebody else. You know what his name was? His name was Jesus. You know what Jesus got accused of? Of being a wine bibber. That he was a glutton. Why don't your disciples fast and pray, Jesus? Well, maybe because I'm right here and they're enjoying me. Isn't that what he said? Yeah. I'm paraphrasing. Isn't that what he said? Yeah. Right? See, we go through life being so miserable as Christians because we think it honors God. Anybody have kids here? How many of you like to have kids here? I told Lisa I want another one. She's going to get away from me. <laughs> You're 52. Shut up. I said, hey, we're good till 70. <laughs> Just saying. Oh, I know. I shouldn't be saying that because you guys don't know what I'm talking about. Need to get to a bar more. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> Here's the deal. People go to bars, and what happens? They drink. Why? So they can loosen up. How many, you know, a person drinks, right, Sheriff Rucker? You know, people drive a lot better drinking, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> They're everywhere. woo Yeah! Woo! Discipline comes off. That's why we arrest them. In a bar, people let their guard down and they start saying things. You know, get somebody drunk, you'll find everything about them. What, because why? They get vulnerable, right? They loosen up, right? They let their guards down. What if the church lived in such a way? I, oh, oh, have you ever seen people in the bar? You ever watch, they get generous too. They get, they get drink a little bit. They go, they go hey, I'm buying it for everybody. Come on, drinks are on me. Woo! Whole lot of love going on in there. Jukebox is being played. You get in church, and nobody wants to do anything for anybody because there's no joy in the place. Everybody's got their guard up. Don't, don't come inside my hula hoop. And I'm just thinking maybe if we drank of the right spirit, maybe actually the world will be drawn to us more than our bars. Yeah. 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 What, what if the church was actually fun to go to? What if the church was actually a time of celebration? What if the church was a time where we just let our guard down? What if the church was a time where we could get intimate with each other? Why? Because we've become vulnerable in his spirit. Why? Because we can. Why? Because we have such a great love being overwhelmed and produced over us and in us that nothing really matters because who could be against me if my father is for me? What am I afraid? What am I afraid to confess? What am I afraid to confess? I, <laughs> Okay, I, I, I do altar calls here, and I ask for people to come to this amazing relationship with Jesus Christ. And like people are like, oh, no, I ain't going up there. I am not going up there. I, if I can do it, I can do it on my own. I can do it on me and God. We got our own thing. I don't stand in front of anybody else. I have to do whatever. I, don't, I, don't. <laughs> I go to this Jake Hamilton concert last, last week, and Jake Hamilton is a worship leader, and he's loud. I'm 52 years old, I don't understand it. You know, I should not like loud music anymore because I'm 52 and I should be more mature and I shouldn't like loud music. And I'm in the front row. And I'm gonna, he turns that amp and he goes, oh! I'm going, yeah, buddy, this is gonna be a good worship service. And he starts breaking out and he goes, you know, worship isn't dependent upon what it sounds like, what it looks like. It's not in a box. It's just your heart being poured out to God. Right? Amen. Get through. I'm, I'm like, I'm going, whole service, you know, I got this going. I'm just like, I'm like, you know, my vertical is going two feet now. It's like, <laughs> I'm, I feel like I can dunk the basketball right now. You know, it's like, why? Because the joy of the Lord is so strong that, that it, it literally overwhelms your every, everything about you and your youth comes back to you. Yeah. Remember what you did when you were young? Yeah. See, the kingdom is like the little children. I went out and played basketball with Matthew and Levi. I'd like to just say, I beat him. <laughs> I know it was only in horse, but I beat him. <laughs> you know, the world's looking for something. They said they'll know that we are Christians by our love. How would the world feel if they had the attitude, if we've represented them, that we love you because we have to? but what if they actually could get an emotional tie, an emotional bind with the body of Christ and experience a love that they've never known? What would happen, man? I think the world would just absolutely get rocked. 
I think the church would get rocked. The Bible says, if we're gonna have a theology, the Bible says that eternal life is this, that you know the one true God. We've made eternal life this, say these words and you're saved. We've made, uh, we've made salvation you know, just about forgiveness of sins. When the reality is, eternal life is this, is that you accept that which has already been paid for for you, and you step into a relationship with the one who wants to be intimate with you. I'm just gonna be straight up honest with you. We're never gonna see people be healed, saved, delivered, set free if we don't first get into a place of intimacy with our Father. Because he's not interested in all those other things. In fact, he said, though you deliver people, though you set people free, though you say, people came, got saved, though you did all these things in my name, I never knew you, so see ya. What's he really interested in? He wants to be intimate with you. Eternal life is this, that you know that you're intimate with the one true God. Hey, cuz, did Christy ever write you any love letters? Huh? Not anymore, right? Right. Not any less, though. <laughs> I got you out of that one, bro. Um, did you fall in love? Did you fall in love with the love letters or the one who wrote them? Yeah. Are you glad that she just didn't tell you in, in a written word that she loved you? but that you actually experience that love. See, I think that's what God's looking for. He's given us the word to read it, to have, you know, say to us, hey, you can be saved, but what good is salvation hearing about it, reading about it under the written word if you don't actually experience salvation? So what good is it to know that God loves you and never experience it? Right? So how do you do it? How do you do it? I think this whole thing of accepting things is a big deal. See, <laughs> I'm gonna rattle you a little bit. Because it rattled me a little bit, but the la I had like five nights just you know, having the Father just love on me. And, and he literally, during that time, he just, you know, he just made me his priority. I think we're afraid to let God make us his priority. But isn't that what love does? It, see, love, what does what? It considers others more than it does itself. Am I right? If God is love, who does he consider more than himself? You! That would just wreck me. You're God. How can you consider me more than you yourself? And I go, and, I go, and, then, I, and then I said to him, Keisha, I said, prove it. He goes, I already did. I gave you my most prized possession. I gave you myself. See, Jesus didn't just die for us. He died as us. It wasn't so we could have a religious experience God gave his only begotten son because he missed us. He missed walking in the cool of the day with us. He missed hanging out with us. He, he missed in, enjoying us. He, he missed hearing us. You know, you know, we love our children to be disciplined, yes? We love the pr 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 what that produces. But I gotta be honest with you, I, I, like, I like playing with them too. I like them being goofy. Levi, I was saying this morning that when I discipline Levi, my greatest opportunity when I discipline Levi is not because I have to discipline him, but it's when I'm emotionally moved when I discipline him 
that there's a connection that happens between us because I'm moved in the fact of when I'm disciplining him, he's drawn to me. See, if, if we don't get this thing about allowing ourselves to walk in an aspect of God that he is, how, how many believe that God actually has emotions? Do you know what he does? Pastor Jane's feeding me stuff here. Keep, keep it coming. <laughs> she just said that, that he actually sits in the heavens and he laughs. Do you know what happens to people when you laugh around them? They wonder, what's going on? Why are you smiling? I go, because I can and you can't do anything about it. <laughs> what does it do? Does a smile change an environment? Does laughter change an environment? Has anybody been in with somebody who has one of those laughs? Leo Shell, you're not here, are you today? Lee's not here, right? This guy knows how to laugh. Anybody who knows Leo, he starts laughing, and everybody in the room will start laughing, and they have no idea why. Well, what would happen, what would happen if actually in church that laughter became contagious? See, we've made that, we've gone, oh, evil. Why would, can I ask you something? Why would the devil want you to laugh? Because the Bible says laughter does good like a medicine. I'm telling you, the devil don't want you feeling good. All right, so what's he done? He's, he's, well, he's, he's wanted the church to become powerless and drab by stealing the emotions of the bride. We have an emotionless bride. How many of you would like to get married to an emotionless bride on wedding night? Yeah, I know Jesus, I'm supposed to love you, so here I am. Be intimate with me. Sorry if that sounds graphic, but seriously. I'm telling you, man. He's preparing. Oh, I'm going to another, I'm going to whole different places when I was first service. It's crazy. Adam and Eve in the beginning. Adam and Eve. What did God say? God said this to Adam. It is not good for you, Adam, be alone. Do you know what God's doing right now for the second Adam? Do you know who we are? It's not good for Jesus to be alone. And he's preparing a bride that is without spot and without wrinkle, that is joyously awaiting marriage day. And we're in anticipating and we're expecting. See, if you don't have emotions, how do you have expectation? Do you know most major things that have ever been done in all of history have been done because something, somebody or something was emotionally charged? How do you have vision about anything if you don't have emotions about something? The Bible says that we are to love, be intimate with things that God loves, and we're to hate things that God hates. The Bible says this. I'm telling you, he wants us to be emotional. He says, be angry, but don't sin. Why? Because your emotions will motivate you to do something that without emotions you never do. That was just an emotional decision you made. Yeah, praise God. You know what? I got emotional about kids killing themselves and seven years ago, I said, we gotta stop it somehow and I had no idea what to do and I didn't do this. Let me tell you what I didn't do. I didn't logic my way out of it. My logic and my reasoning told me, don't do it, it's too big of a cost. My heart moved with emotion said, I don't care what the cost. Your heart will always lead you into something that your mind can't comprehend. Everything in the kingdom is that way. Why is it a walk by faith? Because you can't make sense of it. I'm still trying to figure out why I gotta give them 10% of my money. That don't make sense. I have to keep being reminded of it. And then all of a sudden I see the benefits of it. I go, oh, I was talking to Pastor Jane. I just see you guys, this is, ready? Ready for this, ready for this? This, this suit coat used to be tight on me. All right? 
Yay me, right? Okay, ready for this? I have a refrigerator full of Coca-Cola in my office. No, ready? It's been there since I said no to it. That's on the left side of my, that's on the left, that's on the left side of my office. On the right side of my office, I have Reese cups, <laughs> which have also been there since I said no to it. Pastor Jane said, what are you doing? I said, I'm keeping my eyes focused on the benefits that I have without them. They're no longer fo focused on them. See, because I don't have to say, I don't have to, I don't have, see, if you have a big yes inside of you, you don't have to worry about saying no to everything. And see, I think emotions unlock something of love that I don't, listen, oh, what did I do the other day? Well, I do a lot of stupid stuff and people go, Pastor Scott, you don't have to do that. And I always say to people, and, and that's the voice they use too, every single one of them. Oh, yeah. Pastor Scott, you don't have to do that. <laughs> That's how I hear it. <laughs> Pastor Scott, you know, and I always say to everyone, this is my favorite phrase, for those of you who know it, you know what I'm gonna say. I don't do anything I have to do. I only do what I wanna do. So when I sacrifice, it's not because I have to. When I come to church, it's not because I have to. I, I don't prepare a message because I have to. I, 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 I get to, I want to, it's my life. Pastor Scott, what are you doing here on a Saturday? It's every day. It's your life. Life in the kingdom, see, I, this is what love does. This is what love does, which is an emotion. Like, I can't, listen, I get up in the morning, I can't wait for the day. For probably a year and a half now, I haven't worked a day in my life. You know when it, you know when it becomes work? When I focus on all this stuff that doesn't have benefits. But when I stay, when I stay in the emotion of love, when I stay in the emotion of compassion, when I stay in the emotion of kingdom, when I stay in the emotion, when I stay intimate, the, the things that aren't intimate, the things that are temporal, they don't take away from me my place of intimacy. I don't know if I'm making sense. So if I'm not making sense this service, listen to the nine o'clock service because it was really, really good. <laughs> Let's do this. I'm thirsty. This thing ever unscrew? There we go. Anybody want some? Emotions, when they're positive, give you the ability to actually discover God in a way that knowledge or thoughts will never produce. See, if you don't, if you don't begin to actually be moved in your emotions, you're never really gonna be able to experience his presence. There will be people in here today that will, that this is what, this is the different vantage point. There will be people in here today that will say, well, the worship wasn't that good today. And then there will be people that came here and they actually experienced the love of God here. What's the difference? And they could have sat right next to you. What's the difference? Have you ever heard of this thing called emotional investment? Emotional intelligence. As a man thinketh, so is he. Right? When you are emotionally invested in something, what does it have? What does it have? It has everything. What does God want? Everything, when you're a, so what does it do? The Bible says this, where your treasure is, 
there will be your mind. Where your treasure is, there will be your heart. We've screwed that up and we've said, well, wherever our treasure is, wherever our heart is, that's where we'll put our money. That's where we'll put our time. Can I just change that? I think it's appropriate. Wherever you invest your time and wherever you invest your money, that's where your heart's gonna go. Do you love your child more the first day they're born or does it grow as they're growing? As they grow, right? Why? Because you have an investment. You have an emotional attachment. You have an emotional investment. Why is it that girls that before they get attached to the baby are willing to give the baby up? Or a father. But when they see that child, even on an ultrasound, when they see that child, what happens? They get emotionally attached. But the church has said, get emotionalism out of it. I'm saying, God's saying, get all your emotions in it with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love him. Yes. Amen. Uh, yes, I just have a lot. I, I, yeah. Pastor Scott, God knows what I love him. I told him once, and I'm taking the rest by faith. <laughs> what kind of relationship is that? I want to see you guys' Facebook posts about how in, uh, how in love you are with Jesus. Some people do that about guys. I don't even have to wonder if Erica is passionately in love with her husband. Why? Because Facebook told me so. She used to post about some other things. Not anymore. Why? She might be a little emotionally attached to the man. Are you tracking with me? See, I want people, I want, I want people to know when, when, I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I leave this earth, I want my kids to know that my dad loved God. Yeah, yeah. Not because he said so, but he was wacko. He just loved God. Everything within him, he just loved God. Well, Pastor Scott was a little emotionally attached to God. A little emotionally attached. A little emotionally attached. What's that mean? My heart was attached. He moves me. He woos me. He, he thrills me. He, he <laughs> makes me feel alive. How, do you, how are you alive if your emotions aren't vibrant? See, the enemies wanted the church to become numb. The, the, the enemies wanted the church to become dumb. You know, the, 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 to dry, drab. Why? Because there's nothing attractive to our soul. I mean, oh. What attracts you to somebody that you want to spend the rest of your life with? Well, that's because the academic thing to do. I read something good that I should do it. No, man. You see somebody and you go, oh. I just want to tell you, taste and see that the Lord is good. And then you'll never be the same. You can't be. If you are, then you haven't tasted his goodness. Would you guys sooner me talk about principles? Would that be better if I talked about principles? See, I've, you know, I got this crazy idea that love may be the missing ingredient from the church. Because if his focus, and he says this, without love, everything else is noise. If that's his statement, right, then trying to lead people to the Lord without love is noise. Trying to heal people without love, it's noise. Trying to bring people into salvation, why, why would they want something that you don't have and you can, you're trying to tell them that they can have something that you don't have yourself? But he changes, he makes all things new. And I think that G, when Jesus said, you know, let me be lifted up and I'll draw all men unto myself, lifting him up is the, is the fact of allowing him to be him in you and through you. Yeah. All right, ready? Got a couple minutes left. Six more minutes of this love stuff and you're out of here. <laughs> Six more minutes of this emotional service today. We had an emotional, we had an emotional service today, Pastor Scott. Emotional, very, very emotional. But <laughs> what 
What if there's something that he's wanting to unlock in us that can't be found any other way except for allowing us to have an emotional response, a movement towards him? What if this thing of love is not just practicum? It's not just, what if it's magical? What if it's mystical? What if, what if it's enlightening? What if it unlocks things in you that you didn't know was there? I'd like to propose to you that it absolutely does. You're, you're gonna read the word differently once you understand something that he poured out such a great love for you and has such a great love for you that now, you, now once you receive such a great love, you actually can give him back that which he rightfully deserves, which is a love that only he can give. Okay, so, so let's do this. What if you actually thought about this? What if you actually, actually said that God's more concerned about your glory and you being glorified than he is his own? What if God actually knows that the way he gets glory is by giving it? Isn't that the way of the kingdom? We say that in the kingdom, you only get by what you give. It's the same thing is true. Listen, in uh, Luke 7, Jesus prays for himself and he says, Father, glorify the Son so that you can be glorified. Wow. He just wants me to tell you that he loves your heart. And maybe you thought that you found him, but he's been looking for you and chasing you for most of your life. And he just, he absolutely adores you, man. I don't know what that means, but I just had to tell you. So here, that's from him. This love stuff wrecks you. Jesus prayed this pray, prayer to his father. He said, Father, glorify your son. How many of you have said that? How many of you have had enough guts to say, Father, I just want you to glorify me? <laughs> wow. Wow. Could God be so good that he actually wants to glorify his sons? Maybe the father knows something about answering that prayer that he did for Jesus, because Jesus understood something, because you gotta understand something. Jesus didn't pray anything that his father didn't ask him to pray. So when Jesus prayed the prayer, Father, glorify your son so that you may be glorified, there was something being unlocked in the heavens that was gonna be able to bring glory to God. Why? Because the father's glory is found in his children. Right? Why? How are you gonna give God glory when you have not received it? Am I making sense? How are you, go, how are you gonna be able to give to him something that you have never allowed him to give to you? Now, that makes sense in money, doesn't it? If I come up, Bruce, I need a 1,000 bucks. Come on. Ah, you don't have it, right? right? But if you did, you could give it. And I know you would. So you don't have to steal from me, Bruce, because I'll just ask for it. But how many know that if Bruce didn't have the money that I'm asking for, he couldn't do what? He couldn't give it to me. Bruce, I, I want you to honor me. But if you haven't received honor, you see, you see what relationships do? The Father is not asking us, the, this is a nice aisle, I like this, I can get right back here to Troy. <laughs> the Father is not asking us to do or give anything that he isn't willing to give to us. The problem is we struggle not with the fact of giving, we struggle with the receiving part. Do you know how many people aren't willing to get vulnerable to allow God to love them? Do you know how many people aren't willing to allow God's forgiveness? I just haven't forgiven myself. Don't worry about forgiving yourself. Let him forgive you. Wait, 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 let me back this up. He's already forgiven you. Receive it. He's already demonstrated his love to you. Receive it, why, why, why is it important? Why is it important, church, that we receive such a great love and such a great salvation? For the purpose of releasing that which we've received so that God gets glory in it. So he, glory, he glorifies us, he gives to us, he pours out to us, he loves us unconditionally, he forgives us, he took all of his wrath out and all of his anger out of his son, so he's not angry at you anymore. 
It was done, it was finished, and he wants to give you himself, pour himself into you, pour himself into you for the purpose of himself being revealed to an earth that won't see him because they don't have spiritual eyes. They'll only see him in a physical body like we saw Jesus when he was on the earth. It's the same thing for his bride. We're here to demonstrate the heart of the Father so the world will come to him because the Father wants to be in relationship with the world again. That's good. That's it. That's the story. That's the only story there is. He wants to be back in relationship with, wants to be intimate. How, many, how would you feel if you were pouring yourself out completely and your kids weren't receiving anything from you? We come into his presence and we're so emotionally not connected that we never experience anything of his love. We read about it, but we never experience it. We go to church and we go through the motions, but we never experience it. We're gonna do one more song, because we're done. No more about love today. No more about emotions today. Get off the chandeliers, all you. I see y'all up there wishing there were chandeliers here. I see you. What we're gonna do right now is we're gonna have an emotional response. Your heart, I'm not saying you have to, listen, you, just, here, oh, you know what? God never wants his kids to be more than who they are. But he does want them to be who they are. And if you knew who you were, you would celebrate it. You would celebrate it. How many of you like to see your kids go, stay in this dull, numb state? Or how many like to see your kids be emotionally charged with life? Put your hands on your heart right now, would you? Father, in Jesus' name, I ask that you release and overwhelm us with your love, right to the, oh, to the core. <laughs> Align us to yourself, God. Let us not just read or talk about your love anymore. Let's, let us experience it in such a way, in such a powerful way that it changes everything. It changes everything. Let our hearts get wrapped around you in a way our minds can't so our minds can be renewed into that which our heart already knows. I pray, Jesus. I pray for every family in here that the love of Christ would be so, so consuming that our children would be drawn to that which is you because they see it being so beautifully demonstrated in our everyday life I pray undo us, renew us create in us this new heart let us be that David that would dance before you that would just be emotionally charged every time we're in your presence let that happen take ownership, take lordship of our emotions again, they're yours they, you gave them to us so that we could emotionally be attached to you. <laughs> Free your church, God. Let us whole body, mind, and spirit be totally yours. In Jesus' name. Let's worship him one more time. Let's love on him one more time. Yeah, God bless you guys, man. These altars are going to be open. You want people to just to love on you, pray for you. Come on, let's stand one more time. One more time. If you can, if you feel comfortable, let's just put our hands, our receiver out, our receivers out and just... Let him overwhelm you with his love. Get attached in a deeper way today. In Jesus' name. Let's sing this together. Team, we come. Call things. Work together for me.